Good evening, everyone. Um, it's now seven o'clock. Um, thank you for joining us for Japan Foundation online talk. My name is Junko Takekawa, Senior Arts Program Officer of Japan Foundation London. Jidaigeki, period drama, is an established genre in Japanese cinema. Although categorically anything depicting the past could be period drama, in Japan, one of the typical storyline is hero samurai and the buddies with poetic justice. The stylized format has grabbed many viewers' hearts on the silver screen as well as on TV for a long time. One of the most frequent appearing um, figures, however, wasn't the samurai, but Zatoichi, a blind swordman. He was so popular that many sequels of his film were made and the figure continued to attract filmmakers and viewers alike. In the 60th anniversary of the uh, first Tatoichi film being released, an analytical and insightful book focusing on the popular character was published. I am delighted to invite and introduce the author of the book, The Global Influence of the Blind Swordman, Dr. Jonathan Root, senior lecturer and then program leaders for film studies at the University of Greenwich. As the book title suggests, the book exam examined the character's global influence, but in this talk, after an introduction to this highly recommendable book, Jonathan and his discussant will look into the creation of the Zatoichi character with particular focus on him being blind. Joining Jonathan is Dr. Dolores Martinez, Emeritus Readers in Anthropology at SOAS University of London and the Research Affiliate at, at IS, ISCA University of Oxford, who acts as a chair, as well as Dr. Jasper Sharp, an author, filmmaker, and a curator known for his work on Japanese cinema and a co-founder of the film website Midnight Eye. Together with these experts on Japanese films, this talk will be able to shed a new light on this compelling character and the Japanese cinema industry. Next, housekeeping matters. Today's event will be recorded as we are using a webinar function. Your name will not be viewable by other attendees. However, I strongly recommend you to keep your audio and the video muted throughout, just in case. If you have any questions for the panelists, Please use a Q&A function to send in your question at any time. Remember that attendees' questions may be seen as everyone else so that you can afford particular questions placed by another person which you'd like to answer or if it's the same as yours. Simply click the thumb up icon next to the question you wish to upvote. Unfortunately, due to time restrictions, we may not be able to pick up all of the questions you ask so my apologies in advance. Lastly, as always, we will send you online questionnaire, so please spare a short moment to complete it for our future event. That's all from me now. I'd like to hand it over to uh, Jonathan to introduce his fabulous book. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you. Hello, and uh, thank you, Junko, uh, for that introduction. I'm just gonna share my slides. Very quickly, keep that showing and presenting. Hopefully you can all see that okay. Okay, well, thank you all for attending. And as I said, thank you to Junko and Deli and also Lola and Jasper for helping to uh, organize and uh, present with me this evening. For the sake of ease and consistency with my book research, um, I just wanted to clarify, first of all, that I'll be keeping to Western pronunciations of Japanese names, first name first and family name last. As I've found with a lot of my scholarly research into Zatoichi and Japanese cinema, this is the way that so many Japanese names are published. And when charting the transnational links uh, between Zatoichi and other media, this has often been the easiest way to map it. And here I'd also like to apologise for any poor pronunciations 
of uh, J Japanese words that might come up. So apologies in advance if that happens. Now I wanted to start with this picture. Hopefully that's showing okay. Sorry, I've just got a slight technical error on my end. Uh, let me just start presenting again. Oh, I apologize. I was at the wrong order in my slides. Sorry, we were trying to outline, uh, trying to get out of the way technical niggles at the uh, beginning of the talk, but something always comes up. So I wanted to start with this image. Sorry, I'll get back on track now. I want to start with this image as I see it as the quintessential image of Zatoichi, and it is one of many that inspired the book, while also being one of many images of Shin Tarakatsu playing the blind swordsman. Um, in my mind, it refers to the paths that Ichi wanders in the narratives of the films and TV series, and the paths the character has wandered around the world in terms of homages and imitations. There's a lot of information included in the promotional details for this event, and some people may have already read the blurb of the book. Um, but just in case it helps, I will provide a quick overview of the Zatoichi franchise now. The character first appeared on screen in 1962 in The Tale of Zatoichi, or Zatoichi Monogatari, uh, Zatoichi is portrayed by Katsu as a wandering masseur in 19th century Japan towards the end of the Tokugawa era. Ichi makes his living as a masseur because it was one of the few means of employment available to blind people in Japan at this time. However, he also likes to gamble, and this gets him in trouble with the Yakuza a lot. So he has uh, learned to defend himself with a sword, which he hides within his cane. In the very first film, Ichi is actually quite reluctant. To draw his sword but he ends up having to as the plot progresses. This film became a surprise hit for Daie and in the same year they produced a sequel with the very imaginative title The Tale of Zatoichi Continues or Zoku Zatoichi Monogatari. However that was also a hit and it established the formula for the franchise. More action scenes often with Yakuza or samurai surrounding Ichi as well as him bringing down corrupt Yakuza schemes and saving any innocents involved. Katsu ended up playing uh, the character over 25 films, which were made between 1962 to 73. This was in between his very prolific work for the Daiei studio, of which he became one of its most famous stars before they went bankrupt in the early 1970s. In 1974, Katsu took the character to TV screens and played him in 100 episodes up until 1979. By this time, it seemed that interest in the character had finally faded. Katsu even tried a comeback film in 1989, but it was a commercial failure. This would sadly be one of his last film roles before he passed away in 1997. However, by 1989, interest in the character was very much blooming overseas. This is not the focus of today's talk, but it is a big focus of the book, and I wanted to give a brief overview here. Imitations of the Zatoichi character first turned up in Taiwan in the early 1970s, and if you're curious, you can find uh, on YouTube some clips of the lookalike actor they found for that small number of films. At almost the same time in Japan, Shochiku uh, tried to establish a rival female sword fighter series through the o Oichi films, also known overseas as the Crimson Bat films. But these only lasted for a very short period of time. Zatoichi also inspired. Um, sorry, also inspired the Indonesian comic book character Sibuta, literally meaning the blind, who is basically Zatoichi with magical powers. He appeared in Indonesian action films and TV shows from 1970 until the early 1990s, and there are rumours he may be reintroduced into Indonesian media later in the 21st century. By 1989, the 17th Katsu film, Zatoichi Challenged from 1967, um, had also been officially remade in Hollywood as Blind Fury, starring the late great Rutger Hoyer. All these imitations and homages, and a few others, preceded later Japanese reboots of the character. Most well known around the world is Takeshi Kitano's 2003 film, which was re-released in the USA as it happens earlier in 2022 um, on Blu-ray. In 2008, the film Ichi was released, which instead focused on a female blind swordswoman, then in 2010, Toho financed the film Zatoichi The Last, which attempted to give a new spin on the character, but was also determined to end the franchise once and for all. However, memory of the character has not faded away. 
I explain several examples of this in the book, but it is particularly significant that Disney and Marvel paid homage to the character through the film Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, and the Daredevil web series, which was uh, originally broadcast on Netflix between 2015 and 2018. So the history of the franchise is uh, one important part of the book, but not the only part of it. A lot of the history had already been covered in a lot of the extra materials included on these DVDs and others. DVD, uh, if anyone is curious, DVD is still the best way to access the Zatoichi films legitimately um, in the UK. It may vary around the world in terms of access you can get to these films. But I also found there was more of a story to tell with these films after exploring the history of Dae and Katsu's career through previously published material in print and online, as well as through contacting some great scholars uh, based in France, uh, particularly Robin Gatto and also Fabrice Arduini of the Maison de la Culture du Japon. The Criterion extras are also, uh, also include the short story that Zatoichi originally appeared in, which Kan Shimazawa published in 1948 and claims is based on historical fact, but this is actually not the case. Shimazawa claimed this with a lot of other stories he wrote, many of which are based on historical events and figures, but often loosely. Um, this brings up the interesting point um, that this online talk focuses on, in addition to my book research. Um, so how, uh, what, the question that we're focusing on this evening is how much does Zatoichi relate to the actual historical reality of blind people in Japan, both at the time the films were made and the period settings the stories uh, are set in. Well, other scholars may be better placed to explain the actual history of blind people in Japan, such as Kojiro Hirose, a fantastic historian and scholar based in Japan, who very kindly shared some of his research with me. Um, this particularly helped me to understand the culture of the Kengyo musicians and money lenders from medieval Japan, as well as masseurs and blind female musicians known as Goze, which are an important part of the story of the 2008 film, Ichi. Zatoichi may be a fictional character himself, but Katsu always maintained in several interviews that he knew how to act blind due to his family having a blind servant when he was young. He also had practice before the two Zatoichi films released in 1962. Earlier in 1960, also released by Dae, was one of Katsu's first leading roles as the villainous Suga no Ichi in The Blind Menace, also known as Agent Shira Nui, or Secrets of a Court Masseur. Um, so three titles for that film, uh, not to be confusing particularly there. But anyway, in that film, most commonly known as The Blind Menace, um, here Katsu plays a lecherous, greedy and murderous Kengyo, a far cry from the noble but roguish wanderer he would play two years later. The Kengyo were established earlier in Japanese medieval history, but became particularly infamous as moneylenders during the Tokugawa era. Kengyo could also become highly regarded musicians and priests, but this process took years of discipline and training. Zatoichi is uh, highly skilled in music, massage and sword skills, but he never strives to become more than his lowly status as signified by his name. Zato, meaning blind, is uh, also one of the lowest ranks in the medieval caste society in Japan. So he's lower than the Yakuza, the peasants and farmers. And his given name is Ichi, which simply means one. Not only was the blind menace an important milestone in Katsu's career, it also seemed to shape the picture of some stereotypical depictions of blind characters within Japanese cinema, but also outside of Zatoichi. I'm limited in time with my presentation this evening, and it was not the aim of my book to chart other depictions of blind characters, but I can mention a few widely recognised examples. Scheming, slimy and villainous blind characters, um, when you think of those particular traits, you can start to think maybe they're quite common in Japanese cinema. There is the example of Blind Beast from 1969, based on an Edogawa Rampo uh, story, also released by Dae and it concerns a perverted and sadomasochistic blind sculptor. In 1970, Blind Woman's Curse was released by Nakatsu, where a revenge-driven woman not only becomes blind, but also possessed with dark magical powers. Um, and Meiko Kaji, of course, plays the character that has to defeat her. Alongside these depictions, almost any other blind man that Ichi meets in the films or TV episodes is either bumbling or villainous. 
If you were not Zatoichi, it seemed you were not allowed to be heroic. A more realistic depiction of blindness in Tokugawa era Japan would not come along until 2006, as far as I'm aware, um, with the final part of Yoji Yamada's revisionist Jidai Geki trilogy. Uh, this film is titled Love and Honor and was released in 2006, whereas if you're curious, the uh, other first two films in this trilogy were Twilight Samurai from 2002 and The Hidden Blade from 2004. Love and Honor concerns a loyal samurai retainer who becomes blind after food poisoning, and then he tries to learn sword fighting so he can face another man that has raped his wife. The climactic fight is a far cry from the skills of Zatoichi, but it does suggest what it could be like if a skilled samurai was determined to fight while blind. As mentioned earlier, I've only touched on a few titles here, and I'm welcome to suggestions of other Japanese films that today's speakers and the attendees of this talk are aware of in terms of blind characters and contrasts with how Zatoichi is depicted. Another stereotype is confirmed by the character of Chirrut Imwe in Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, very much inspired by Zatoichi uh, and his mentor, uh, as was, sorry, Daredevil and his mental stick as depicted in the Marvel series, if anyone's seen that. Um, this photo was actually taken by me in May 2017 at the London MCM Comic-Con, where Don Yen appeared on stage alongside this image and confirmed that he was inspired by Zatoichi when asked to play this character in the Star Wars film. Blind characters in Asian media, as well as in a fair number of Western films and TV shows, are often depicted as wise and intelligent characters, as well as sometimes having superhuman abilities. Indeed, Zatoichi has also has the habit of sharing his experiences and pseudo philosophical advice with those he meets on the road or those he is forced to fight and he often has to fight characters um, that he meets in the films and tv episodes after making friends with them. Though there are many contrasting depictions of blind characters around the world the more heroic and wise characters that we see in certain films and tv shows may just be inspired by the famous but fictional blind swordsman. So thank you all for coming along and listening to my introduction to this talk. I'd now like to welcome on the other, other speakers, uh, Lola and Jasper. Well, thank you for that. It was all too brief in a way, Jonathan. I could have listened to you for far longer. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and Jasper is joining us as well. We already have one question in the Q&A. So before I ask mine, I think it's a very interesting question. So I just thought I would bring it up. And that is from Linda Landers, who wants to know if any of the books or DVD covers are in Braille. That is a very interesting question. And I'm sorry yeah. that I don't know the answer to that. Um, it's something that I hadn't heard from when I did get back into contact with Kojiro uh, Hirose. Uh, a couple of years ago now. I kept him updated on the status of the book since over the last year or so. Sadly, I haven't heard from him very recently, um, but he, he never told me about this. Instead, he told me a lot of the history that he knew. He didn't tell me anything about the reception of, um, of the uh, Zatoichi films with the blind community in Japan that he was aware of. And this also reminds me of a comment that I heard from a year or so ago from someone that I now know who, who lives in Japan. I know a few people that live there now. Um, uh, th this particular person said that um, he wasn't seeing the Zatoichi films and TV episodes shown that much on Japanese television anymore. So to be honest, I don't know the exact answer to that question, but going from what hasn't been mentioned to me by some people living in Japan at the moment, I I'm guessing that might not be the case that they are available in Braille. Um, so that's what I'll be doing. I, I have some questions, but as we go along, I'll be checking the Q&A and, and bringing questions in from that. Um, I would like to ask a first question, which I think helps give us a little bit more background um, that, that comes out of your book. You mentioned that the first uh, story about Zatoichi was written in 1948. And as I read the rest of the book, I found myself wondering, well, how post-war then, how immediately post-war is this characterization? A, we could say a wounded Japanese man fighting against, against all odds. And, um, and, and 
Jasper and, and Jonathan, if you could speak a little bit to that, because I think it, it's a theme you pick up in the book as well by talking about Kurosawa films, but we'll come back to that perhaps. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, happy to start with that question. Um, so yeah, he's very much a post-war character. As he said, uh, the short story wasn't published until 1948. The film doesn't come until much later, 1962. And I make a lot out of, uh, I focus on the first film, quite a lot because it's it's such an important milestone, of course, in the, in the history of this character. But it's also a very different film from the rest of the Zatoichi films. As I said, he's very reluctant to draw his sword and um, it ends with him berating the Yakuza who are celebrating, um, you know, the massive, uh, the, the Yakuza gang that Ichi ends up inadvertently, he doesn't really plan for it to go this way, fighting on the side of with this great Yakuza battle at the end of the movie. So they've successfully and violently taken over a rival gang's territory and they're all celebrating and everything. Um, but he, he berates them and calls them fools, uh, Bagaro, and um, says, uh, uh, um, says you shouldn't be celebrating. So how many of your men are dead around you? Why are you celebrating in the aftermath of this violence? And um, he, he ends up uh, giving a sword fight, uh, a, a, a rival swordsman, a ronin, um, played by, oh, I've forgotten the name, uh, uh, it's annoying, uh, Miki Hirate, who actually is a character that turns up in other films, he's got an interesting history, uh, he's played by Shigeru Amachi, if I've remembered the name right, in the film, and um, yeah, he's, uh, Ichi is also very reluctant to, to kill him, because he just made friends with him, and also he's uh, one of the, uh, uh, he's another famous trope in himself, Miki Hirate, in this film, he has tuberculosis, and he's looking for an honourable death. Um, and when he finds out, you know, the ma magnificent sword skills that which he has, he wants to die by his hand. But he is very reluctant in this film to do that. So it ties into kind of those post-war sensibilities I think you're getting at there, Lola, in terms of, uh, you know, co condemning violence. Ichi being very reluctant to, uh, you know, um, draw his sword if he ab unless he absolutely has to in this film. And then it's interesting where the film goes afterwards um sometimes in some of the films that come immediately afterwards in the 60s uh that characterization seems to be retained on screen in some of those 60s films but as the pro series progresses into the late 60s and early 70s it just become an excuse for more and more action mm -hmm. up in the ante on screen so the political slant um that the film seems to start with seems to uh go away so i hope i haven't um brushed over that too broadly i don't know if jasper wants to come in and maybe yeah, yeah i was uh, wondering what or, jasper thought or yeah. question any of that uh well i'm thinking about like pre-war the mm. sort of um presentations of blind people and only two immediately spring to mind one of these is uh tenisuke kinagasa's crossroads which is a silent film uh, actually, the first ever Japanese film, one of the first ever Japanese films to play in London and, and in the West. Mm. Um, but it was described as a Jedi Geki without swords, uh, modelled on German Expressionism. And mm. it basically tells the story of a impoverished uh, brother and sister. And uh, the brother falls foul of some local hoodlums at this sort of funfair uh, carnival sort of scenario and ends up getting ash thrown in his eyes and is temporarily blinded. Um, and in this example, he's, you know, blindness, he's rendered as this sort of object of pity. Um, so certainly not someone with any sort of dramatic agency in the same way that Zatoichi might be. Uh, the other one is, uh, well, a contemporary drama. It would have been contemporary in 1938, which is uh, Hiroshi Shimizu's The Masseurs and the Woman, um, mm. which is uh, a story of um, set in a, in a travelling inn, a ryokan, in, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the countryside, and it features on a whole group of people that converge, two of whom are blind masseurs, and one is this mysterious woman that one of them falls for. Uh, so I think that's an example of a film where you you are definitely forced to identify with the the sort of blind characters um and you know one of them senses something very mysterious about this woman through her smell um with regards to the post-war ones that you mentioned blind beast and blind woman's curse i mean what's interesting is that both of them are based on works by edagawa rampo as you as you mentioned uh who 
really made this idea of amplified sort of sensations and perceptions really part of his prose. And uh, if we set aside Blind Beast, well, I'm Blind Beast, you know, is this uh, blind, uh, kidnapper, psychopathic uh, blind sculptor who ad abducts uh, his model and then attempts to sort of replicate her body in this huge sculptural form. Um, and they develop, they live in this blind cavern full of these sort of biomorphic shapes of female body parts and uh, eventually have this completely tactile relationship which sort of goes purely into this sort of sensual realm. Um, but Blind Woman's Curse is an interesting one because there's obviously elements in Zatoichi there in, in Meiko Kaji's character, as you say, sort of confronts a blind swordswoman. But this is a sort of hodgepodge of various yakuza elements i mean there's bits of zatoichi there's bits of the red peony gambler series but also healthy doses of rampo as well and interestingly one of the main characters who pops up is the uh buto dancer tatsumi hijikata who sort of pops up as this sort of hunchback that sort of forms all these contorted shapes in the background and i think this is very much in view of that sort of and Kokubuto's sort of idea of like the frailty of the human body and, and this obsession with um, flesh and uh, and mutations of body and new conceptions of, of um, humanity after the war, certainly when people came back mutilated and of course you had the problems of the Hibakusha who were off blinded by the A-bombing. Yeah. So I mean, there, there's some examples I could throw out. Yeah. I, I think I think that nicely brings the point home. Um, we've got questions coming up in the Q and A, and and one of them speaks to some of the things you've just mentioned in passing, both of you, um, which has to do with male and female characters. Um, so Dajane Zar, I hope I pronounced that correctly, wants to know what are the key differences between the male and and female heroic figures in the way they are de were depicted in the films or in the storylines. Um, so you've touched on it a bit, but could you elaborate for us? Yeah, I guess um, with in terms of the female and uh, and male heroes and their differences in terms of blind swordsmen, uh, blind sword fighters. Sorry, I should say to cover both uh, categories. There, um, a, a startling difference when you look back through it is the the numbers. You know, um, it's partially down to uh, I mean, one one can't get away from this point. It's down to the star power and success that he had at the time of Katsu. You know, that's one of the reasons why there's so much more depictions of the blind uh, male hero or uh, sword fighting hero on screen. But even if you just discount that and look at other depictions, either overseas or just in Japan, um, the the number of, of blind um, heroes to these tales is predominantly men, um, where, where, wherever you look. Um, so women are often... Uh, marginalized in that way and you could say you know there's a, a larger historical context about I know I know there's lots of research going on about this at the moment on a national and global scale you know that's historically maybe always been the case um, that there has been that gender bias um, but even if you look beyond that there's still some interesting differences um, so thanks again for that question um, it's an interesting one. There are some interesting differences with how they're depicted on screen. I, I don't think it's the case. I mean, if anyone else is familiar with depictions of uh, both blind uh, female sword fighters as well as male, I don't think it's the case that we have had a completely gender flipped version of the Zatoichi character, because whenever they have attempted that, um, they've often, uh, the filmmakers often feel obliged to include the very mel melodramatic elements, which often d evolves into a love story, which more than often not in these films comes to a tragic end. If the female blind swords fighter, whether it's Oichi or in the later film um, in 2008, Ichi, um, uh, or whether they develop feelings for a character that either dies or has to die by their own hand, um, that, that always um, seems to be in there. Um, and sometimes in some cases that has been criticized in some of the reception of the films um, and we haven't had the straightforward you know um, female drifter coming into town and just finding the bad guys and and uh, killing them and then moving on as it happened in so many Zatoichi films. Well, one alternative argument that could be brought up to that is that in, in a very few of the films um, especially the Katsu ones uh, not so much in the TV episodes 
Um, but in some of the films, uh, there is suggestion that a love interest could develop and Ichi maybe has the opportunity to settle down and usually because of forces against him, and again, he's forced into drawing his sword, um, those hopes are dashed away or he has to leave um, uh, against the wishes of someone that wants to settle down with him and maybe start a family. So sometimes that comes up, but if, you've, if you're in a female blind sword fighter film, that's almost guaranteed uh, to come up. It seems it can't be avoided. Yeah, and that's something I think Jasper has touched on. That that the, 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 with the with the women, there's always the sensual aspect that that gets put into the character that may not be so predominant in the male characters, and then there follows the love story. Is that would you say that's right, Jasper? Or? Yeah, I mean, I have seen the first Crimson Bat Blind Oichi film many many years ago, and I'm trying to remember much about it other than. I, th I think there's a, certainly a vulnerability to the character there, which you don't get with Shintaro Katsu's uh, portrayal of Zatoichi. And even the non-blind sort of women films, I mean, I think, you know, the most famous being Lady Snowblood. You know, yeah. effectively, this is a, it would fit into the template of a rape and revenge film. You know, she, she's mm. the, there fighting against oppression. Um, Whereas I think, you know, seeing Zatoichi is more going into town and seeing corruption and righting wrongs and his blindness is a handicap, but not one that actually does seem to handicap him. Yeah. Um, and, um, ooh, I, I seem to have lost a question, which was, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, we had a question about how the depictions of Zatoichi may have affected um, Japanese audiences who may themselves be in some way disabled and whether we know anything about that. Um, uh, and uh, it seems to have gone, but I think it's a good question. So if, if we have any ideas about this, it would be great to hear an answer. Yeah. Very good question. Uh, the order of the questions can change, I think, if people vote for them. So I don't know if it's just changed position there on the list, Lola. Um, but yeah, that's a, that is a great question. Um, I wish I knew the definitive answer to that. I mean, I will say what I can say is the films were successful. I mean, you can see that by the re release rate of some of these films. I, I touch on this in the book when there's particularly high ratio of Zatoichi films coming out each year. I think it reaches its height around maybe 64 or 65. I'm sure it's one of those years where there's like four Zatoichi films out in one year. And, um, you know, I thought that was crazy at first, first reading about it, but then you find out the rest of Katsu's filmography and you find out that he's also doing the Akumyo series, the uh, Outlaw, uh, sorry, uh, Hoodlum Soldier series uh, later on and, and lots of others. Um, but then you also hear about the, the stars that he's trying to rival with in terms of become more popular than, and you realize it's, this is part and parcel of, of Japanese studio production at the time. They're all tied into these rigid studio contracts and just churning out more and more films. Um, Zatoichi is one of these, as I've already explained, one of these really successful ones. So it seemed to grab the audience's attention, but the question is still there as to whether that affected um, you know, or inspired maybe some people that were watching these films and were themselves disabled, whether that's in terms of sight or another disability. It seems to have been a uh, means of inspiring, you know, putting other similar characters on screen. We've already mentioned bl uh, female blind sword fighters. Um, there is a, also some a very few examples of this inspiring surprise, surprise, because this happens so much with samurai films, Jidai Geki and Shambar in general, they inspire westerns over in Hollywood. There's there's a couple of blind gunslinger films, but not many of those. And um, also, the, uh, perhaps most significant is the One Armed Swordsman series, um, which became popular in Hong Kong because, of course, later on in the early 70s, you have the crossover with the One Armed Swordsman um, meeting um, Zatoichi. So two disabled characters on screen. So. Where, uh, again, I don't, I wasn't able to find any historical evidence in terms of if that really spoke to um, a disabled audience or seen as an empowering depiction of that on screen. But also remember, you know, this is talked about a lot these days, and I think it's great, you know, that this is being talked about more in terms of disabled actors or, uh, or cast and crew being given more opportunities on the screen or behind the screen. Um, but remember, back in the day, you know, this is a sighted actor. 
uh, playing a blind person. Um, Jibi Wang Yu, of course, very famous for the one-armed swordsman, but so many other film roles. You know, he actually has both his arms. He's, he's, he is a completely able-bodied actor. These, these opportunities at this time aren't being given to disabled people, so they could be seen as being inspired, but also but granted this could be an anachronistic new view, but they could be critiqued as well um, for the ways in which they are uh, depicting those characters. That being said, there's also a long history of this. I always uh, forget to mention this when I'm talking about the book, but I have mentioned it in the book. There is a long history of other characters with disabilities being portrayed on screen in Japan. And of course, a, a character with a much longer history, though not with one particular actor, um, in Japan is, of course, Tanga Sazen, the one-eyed, one-armed swordsman. So there are some earlier uh, parallels as well. I mean, I liked your earlier point about, and, and ja no, Jasper actually brought it up about people coming back from the war and post-atomic bomb, that you, you would have been um, more aware of this. But it's certainly the case that when I first went to Japan to do my field work, um, I, I met a, a disabled person at the University of Tokyo where I was at who said, you know, it's like being a foreigner to be disabled in Japan, even if you are Japanese. So I think by the 80s, things had changed a great deal for people with disabilities. And my impression now is that this is changing again towards mm -hmm. having to think about access. Um, but I'm not quite sure. Do we know, has it changed in terms of put, being portrayed on television and cinema? in a more open way. Um, Jasper, would you have any thoughts on this? No? <laughs> I mean, I think Jonathan gave a very thorough answer. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, I, I think the thing is that Jedi Geki is, is interesting because it's a way of you have an established formula, you have an established genre, which um, is, can you hear me? I seem to have cut out. No, no I, I can hear you fine, is... yeah. Oh no! I can hear you, Jasper. Can we can you hear, hear you. Reason? All right. Well, well sorry, everyone else Jasper is frozen back. on my screen. Oh, <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Well, if, okay, it seems like I'm. I've. I can't hear myself, uh, or can't hear you. But I will carry on talking. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, Yes, yeah, so Jedi Geki as a whole is a very good arena for, for highlighting very contemporary social uh, problems because it's so established in, in the uh, sort of um, iconography and the sort of characterization. And just with regards not specifically to blind people or, or um, disabled uh, people, but uh, when one of my first experiences of uh, Japanese cinema, one of my introductions to Japanese cinema was the Lone Wolf and Cub uh, mm. series, which yes. was re-edited and packaged in the UK as Shogun Assassin. It was a video nasty. Um, but, you know, you're looking at uh, the story of a, a wandering assassin who's... Uh, um, left banished from by his feud lord and then and, and uh left after his wife is killed he's left to trundle around this with his sort of uh, baby cart pushing this this pram armed with swords and looking after this you know infant child and i think that's another way of expressing you know the vulnerability of a character that's also tackling other um sort of ideas such as you know the breakdown of family units and, and, and the role of emphasizing the role of fathers in the upbringing of the children which i think would have been quite new in, in 1970s japan and while we're on the subject in the wolf, wolf and cub of course this was a katsu productions after shintari katsu left dae in 1967 set up his own um, independent production company and the the main character ogami ito is played by katsu's brother tomasaru Waka, wakayama and uh, but also directed the film was directed by Kenji Misumi, uh, so who did uh, First Tale of Zatoichi and many other great films. A bunch of unsung hero. I mean, I think the problem is that Western focus on Japanese cinema has generally been so auteur led that we're not used to looking at films like Zatoichi as in the same way as classic films by Ozu and Naruse or Kurosawa. So a lot of these films don't. A lot of the directors of these films are just seen as B-movie directors and, and uh, a lot of these films are overlooked and, and passed over in serious discussions. So um, mm. I, I, I'm very much welcome Jonathan's book on this because it's, it's a great way of approaching Japanese cinema. 
Um, and, and I've seen now the questions pop back up. It's Leo Capella who asked that question about um, depiction of dis other disabled people in, in Japan. Um, but yes, I, I, I have a wolf and cub story to tell, which is when I worked for Channel 4 and they had a Japan season way back in 1987. And we were um, preparing all these Japanese programs to show on Channel 4 and editing them down, we were sent an episode of Wolf and Cub. And the discussion with Channel 4 about how violent that was and whether or not it could be shown on British television was, was something else. But we have lots of questions piling up, so I won't go on with that. Um, our next question is from Camera Hall, and he wants to... Uh, they want to know, within the Zatoichi narratives, how important is the movement of the character between urban and rural settings? Do these offer perspectives on class and power structures? And I, I, that's a question that speaks so much to me, you know, from my having looked at Kurosawa films. Um, Jonathan, can, can you talk us through that a bit? Yeah, yeah, I will uh, as best as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Cam, for the meaty question. One of my colleagues there, I think, from, from Greenwich. I'll hopefully see him on campus soon. And uh, yeah, th I genuinely thank him because that's an interesting question because I, I guess I didn't, I haven't discussed this as much within the book in terms of deep thematic textual analysis. Sometimes it has come up, I think, especially in terms of the shift in the tone of the films um that the series takes especially going into the late 60s and early 70s and then onto tv um but first of all um uh, moving between the urban and the rural i would say that for the majority of the films and tv episodes they these could be classed as stories happening in the more rural settings though sometimes zatoichi does go to the more urban areas or more bustling areas um sometimes he's in some port towns and villages and uh, a couple of times even gets on a boat uh, to, to travel as well up and down Japan. Um, and what, uh, uh, what you're left with the impression of like taking this all in and with the impression of different classes in different parts of society, um, as I understand it from watching the films and the TV episodes, is that first of all, there's a lot of criticism for the caste society, um, which can be read allegorically. You know, are there, are there some things being said about class and society in Japan in the contemporary period in the 1960s, as well as putting all these allegories down in the in the historical medieval setting. And of course, there were lots of Jidaigeki films doing that, especially in the 50s and 60s, especially around the time the first Satoichi film is set. I talk a lot about how it's uh, released very closely in line with um, what happens with Kurosawa, with the uh, Yojimbo and Sanjiro films. Um, and also uh, it comes out the same year as the original Harakiri, um, which uh, very much focuses on these issues in terms of the caste society and, and critiquing the structures that are in place and how the samurai are so honoured. Um, a lot of this comes out in terms of greed being critiqued a lot, especially through the nefarious schemes of the Yakuza um, that Zatoichi is always uncovering in these films. So uh, the message seems to be that um, uh, greed is very much frowned upon. Um, especially with Zatoichi, you know, being praised as the hero, leading this very frugal kind of drifter existence where he's not aimed to get greedy, like um, uh, in a very stark contrast to his Suganoichi character from The Blind Menace. Um, so that's uh, that's critiqued a lot. And if, uh, if samurai characters do crop up, they're not the bad guys in these films as much as the Yakuza are. Um, but the samurai, if they do turn up, they will usually be part of a nefarious Yakuza scheme. Whereas, uh, again, it seems to be the rigid class structures are being criticised because they can be the root of corruption that affects a lot of people. And this actually takes me back to, I've just remembered, um, you, uh, this is a significant point also brought up in the crossover with the one-armed swordsman film. Um, the fact that Zatoichi ends up having to defend a uh, Mandarin-speaking child in, in that film because his parents have been inadvertently killed by the samurai um, because they're, they're trying to protect their child from a, an official daimyo procession. And the law was in medieval Japan, if you cross the line of that procession, of course, this, this Chinese child doesn't know because he's Chinese and he's, uh, he doesn't understand the laws. But if you cross the road in front of that procession, immediately you're sentenced to death. Um, um, and so that seems to be critiqued. 
um, in that film, and that's used as a premise of um, uh, that and the and the language barrier between the two characters is built as the premise for uh, you know all the events that lead up to their climactic fight, which is a whole story in it itself. I cover this a lot in the book, but I won't go into that too much now um, in terms of the 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 ending of uh, Zatoichi meets the one on swordsman and I, sh I probably shouldn't include too many spoilers in tonight's talk anyway. <laughs> they should buy the book and read it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's just a quick comment here um, and then another question whether Lone Wolf and Cub appears to be the origin for the road by McCormick. Um, <laughs> that's just a passing comment I think um, and that's <laughs> Elena Arkeoli. Yes? It's quite an interesting because I think we can look at the sort of um, ping pong influence between American and Japanese culture. I mean, mm. I know that Lone Wolf and Cub was explicitly stated as, as the influence for the manga behind Road to Perdition, the Sam Mendes film. Mm. Uh, and I wouldn't surprise, I can't remember if, I, I don't know if it's been cited as an influence for the Cormac McCarthy book, but I mean, obviously that sort of narrative is is you know, an older person protecting a young child through the landscape of adversity. Um, but I mean, the with regards to the, you know, the, the Ujimbo templates, I mean, it was very much a sort of 1960s sort of thing, with like, you know, the, the lone drift of the outsider coming into a town, seeing it full of rife with corrupt officialdom um, and, and righting wrongs and trying to fight injustice and, and I definitely think that's a, a product of the time in, in Japan you know looking at the say the political system where people didn't trust their leaders but also at a more local and a corporate level um, but of course that comes from you know the American Western so uh, I mean I, I was gonna say that the, that template when we're talking about serials in um, such as the Zatoichi serial. I mean, th this was explicitly Jedi Geki, but you had other stuff like Nakatsu were doing their Nakatsu action films. And one thing that uh, springs to mind there, and we often talk about the connection between Jedi Geki, the samurai films, and the American Western, but um, you have the Rambling Guitarist series, which began in 59, 1960, uh, with Akira Kobayashi as this sort of leather jacket, guitar strumming, horse riding sort of. Uh, hero that roams around Hokkaido in the first film um, and again is fighting for the native sort of Hokkaido, um, the Ainu's rights against corporate uh, developments coming from mainland Japan. Um, so, and every episode he sort of roams into a new town and, you know, this went on for nine films, defeated the bad guy, had a big fist fight at the end and, and then roamed on to the next place. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this the whole idea of the serial in Japan, I think it was really took off in the 60s and, and often this, this sort of template. Um, yes, and uh, another kind of question you may not be able to answer from Mo Pickering is whether there's audio description of the films for blind, partially blind Japanese audiences. I haven't, again, another great question because you think this would really speak to those sorts of audiences. I haven't come across any releases that do have audio description included. I've forgotten to look up in depth the specs of, as I just said, um, it was just earlier this year, coincidentally, that Kitano's film got re-released again um, mm. on Blu-ray. I haven't looked into the specs to see if that's offered, but I suspect not because I haven't seen a lot of this uh, being offered on um, older Japanese titles that I've seen um, getting released recently. Um, I, I don't think this is the case on some of the titles that it was briefly mentioned in the presentation slides earlier that um, Jasper's been involved with re releasing for Arrow. Though I did see that one of Arrow's horror releases, I saw this on a newsletter um, maybe a couple of months ago now, one of uh, Arrow's upcoming horror releases, this is totally outside of Japanese cinema, I can't remember if it's an American or European horror film, is going to have audio description in it. So this might be something that could change in the future 
but as far as I know, uh, with all the DVD copies that I've come across of the, the, the Zatoichi films, some of which you can see behind me, um, they're, uh, they're not included audio descriptions, sadly. I, I think the streaming services are, are doing this more and more, and that may be something Could well that, be, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, someone, yeah, someone did mention in the chat earlier that, yes, if you are in the States, sorry, I'm talking from the perspective of the UK earlier when I mentioned yeah. DVD is the best place to get mm. these films. Someone did mention in the chat that, yes, they are available on the Criterion channel, and mm -hmm. I don't know what sort of audio and subtitle options they offer yeah. on the Criterion channel in the USA. We, we, we've got two questions that I think can be combined here. Um, another one from Daj Dajane and one from Pia Brell. And uh, Brell's is a comment really, how the road to um, perdition was the graphic novel first before be being a film. And um, Frank Miller, who created Stick in the mid 80s, worked with the writer Chris Claremont to give Wolverine a Japanese influence. It became the film The Wolverine later on. So that picks up Jasper's point about the West, the influence on the West. Um, and I think that leads nicely to the question, which is um, that there are all these characters built on the legacy. But can you tell us about what some of your favorite key figures are that were born out of this legacy, both from Japan and other countries? Um, yeah, I mean, one of the characters that I ended up learning a lot about, um, I thought I knew a fair bit about Zatoichi going in and, and embarking on the project, first of all, but then I, I learned some really interesting stuff along the way. Um, when back in 2019, I forget which month it was, I was actually at SOAS um, for an event on Indonesian cinema in 2019 um, run by Eki Imanjaya and Hikmat Dharmawan and Eki I'd already known actually we were both postgraduate students at University of East Anglia and it was great to catch up with him again in London but they told me a lot and they got to show me some of the actual comics that this character turned up in first of all they told me a lot about Buta, and it was it was great learning about the Indonesian um, you know kind of homage uh, a character that basically came up um, in that part of the world and how close those parallels, well, how, how uh, close there were some parallels and also some significant contrasts. I mean, as I briefly mentioned earlier, he's basically Zatoichi with magical powers. Uh, he's very rooted in Indonesian mythology and he's become quite successful uh, 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 as a character in, in of himself, as a popular character in of himself in, in Indonesia. Mostly, again, interestingly enough, played by one actor, Ratno Timur. So it was fun uh, learning about him. I was, of course... Um, you know, having watched Star Wars from a very young age, I was also hugely pleased to see the character of, uh, of Chirrut Imwe turn up in Rogue One. Mm -hmm. And it was also very pleasing to find um, a lot of the reviews I've cited in my book, actually, the number of reviews that uh, described that film as Zatoichi in space because of the appearance of this one character. So that was useful for me for seeing that loads of other people were making those connections, but also, again, showing the global recognition that Zatoichi has, which was very useful, uh, again, to include um, in the book. So I was happy to see that, as well as the homages to Zatoichi that come up with uh, in the Daredevil series, which are rooted, quite rightly, as Jasper said, in the Frank Miller iterations mm -hmm. of the character in the 80s. One, one interesting piece of trivia I did find, but I haven't found any evidence beyond, you know, uh, suspicions or, 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 or assumptions we can make, is that the first Daredevil comic apparently was published in 1964, and that's, of course, two years after the first Japanese Zatoichi film. But I can't find out for the life of me if Jack Kirby and Stan Lee were inspired by um, Shintaro Katsu's character. Who knows? I couldn't find out for certain, though. Well, I, I still remember the comment after Avatar came out and someone's, someone's saying, so James Cameron is fully aware of, you know, Japanese anime and film. And the answer was no, but, he, but his artists, you know, his artistic directors were. Yeah. Um, and I think that speaks to Jasper's point about how, how strong the connections are between the, the two cinemas. Jasper, yes. And and the rest of Asia as well, because yeah. I mean, I think this is what's interesting about the films of Daie in particular, these kind of serials, if they did play sort of Western cinemas, they weren't playing the art house cinemas, they were playing sort of the, you know, Japanese language speakers uh, in, in those sort of communities or in Hawaii or Los Angeles, but also across Asia. I mean, I, I think that the links, um, I mean, the producer, 
I've forgotten his name temporarily. Nagaichi uh, Mas- Ma- so, Masaka- sorry, Nagata. Yeah. Nagata. Nagata. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Was actively trying to cultivate Western audiences in the fifties. Yeah. Then realised that you know there's only so much money you can make out of America because they'd rather watch American films, and so was actively courting. Um, a more Asian uh, audience. And so these films will be playing around Phil- Philippines and Taiwan. And I, I think that's why you see, you know, things like uh, Zatoichi and the One-Armed Swordsman. And um, I, that doesn't really answer the question, does it? But, no, um, but, it, but it builds on the background, which I think is, is useful. I mean, one of the things I find myself wondering, because I discovered Jackie Chan by being in Japan, where he was huge, <laughs> was whether Jackie Chan has ever played a blind or disabled um, character. I don't know the answer. Someone may know. But, um, you know, how, how far did the influence go with this hugely popular martial arts character? Uh, yeah, I uh, I'm I'm not as big on Jackie Chan films as I am on other martial arts films, and obviously, um, you know, uh, Jidai Geki. Um, I've never heard of him playing that sort of character, but it's interesting, you know, the characters, uh, the actors that have done that, like Jimmy Wang Yu. He almost got typecast, not just as the White Armed Swordsman, but also becoming the One Armed Boxer uh, later as well was another one of his. Um, so if you if you did get that hook of being you know, a disabled character, it might it might lead to some typecasting in some cases. Um, I had a, a question which I hope we have time for you to think about, which is one of the things I'm often asked about when I'm talking about Kurosawa films is, is how Kurosawa worked with his cameras and how he filmed those fight sequences. Um, can you, can, could tell us a little bit more about how you how this might have been done for this character. Um, it's it's a kind of technical question, but I, mm. I think it tells us something about decisions being made, how to portray um, a blind character. Ah, yeah, and there's a you might want to see the chat as well, um, Lola. There's some interesting comment come up about Jackie Chan. Um, but yeah, on the point that oh, you... that's right, it's Drunken Master. Yeah. I was thinking Drunken of Drunken Master. Drunken Master. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. okay. So you yeah. had seen that one. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Um, sorry, I've almost forgotten the um... camera camera <laughs> movements. Camera work. And... Yes. Yeah. Yes. Camera I'm work. hoping I'm hoping Jasper can help her a bit with this because it was really interesting seeing the recurring names working on these films throughout the history of the Zatoichi films, and then go also going into the TV series, and um, you know you find out how prominent they are on. Uh, on uh, uh, other Dae productions, um, like uh, Jasper, you worked a lot on the Daimajin release for Arrow, and there was a massive, uh, I, I thought that was fascinating because there was a massive documentary by Fujio Morita on there who shot all the Daimajin films mm-hmm. and the special effects. He'd worked on a lot of Zatoichi films, um, and there's even some interviews that you can find. I've, I've cited some of them um in the book as well that you can find and and the perspective that you're given on the production of the Zatoichi films is really interesting from the cinematographer's perspective Kazuo Miyagawa um uh uh shoots a lot of the Zatoichi films too and he worked with I think mostly Mizubi on the Zatoichi films in terms of director but he's also of course famous for working on Kurosawa films and also Mizuguchi films I think if I've got those those names right and his his credits there are those worked on a lot more films um, so they, they seem to bring a lot of it, the other technical members of crew, which um, was really interesting for me learning about and, and uh, charting all that um, in the book. And it, it started raising questions early on, you know, who's responsible for um, Zatoichi becoming so popular? Is it all down to Katsu and the star power or is it down to the other talent that he's working with? Um, and the other point I was going to mention is actually, yeah, later on, there is also famously, it's, a, it's in the Criterion box set as well. There's John Nathan's documentary on Katsu, The Blind Swordsman. And you also see that actually, you know, some of this is, is particularly important in terms of how Katsu is playing the character, because you just see how much he's practicing offset, um, you know, his, his fight moves and everything. But a, a, a lot is, um, a, uh, you know, a, a lot is um interestingly revealed by those recurring crew names um in in the credits and a lot so a lot of this has to do with you know the structure and the people that die have at the time hopefully you agree jasper 
Uh, well, within Daiei, you have to remember, there were two studios, effectively. You had uh, Daiei Tokyo and Daiei Kyoto, and Daiei Kyoto were very much um, fixated on, on Jidai Geki. And so they had all the sets there. They had the, you know, the stuntmen, they had the um, art directors. Um, so it's interesting. I mean, talking about the Daimajin film, uh, Kenji Masumi directed the second one of them, of course. So, and and um, I should go back to talk about Buddha, but I don't think we've got time. But you know, no, no. so much, uh, <laughs> so much con continuum. The sort of stuff he was doing. But I mean, I, it was funny because I came um, off producing the Daimajin box set, having just uh, produced. Irizumi, the Masamura film, and they were literally released three months apart, and you can see them reusing the same set. Um, yeah. Same with the Yokai Monsters film, so you can tell there's the same talent, the same look to the films. And I know that the attitude um, that uh, of the Daiya Kyoto staff was that they were absolute craftsmen. They were obsessive craftsmen. They weren't worried about just doing things quickly and cheaply. They wanted to make stuff look as realistic as possible. So with Daimajin, they always said, we're not doing anything, you know, this is a story of a giant stone statue that comes to life in, in feudal Japan and crushes towns and stuff. And they said, we're not doing anything like those silly Gamera films they do in Tokyo. We want to do something where we get all the period detail perfectly right and the monster appeals, appears as if it was there, not as sort of like these separate special effects sequences. So I think what they were looking for was this integrated whole and refined over the years through films like Zatoichi, through the sleepy eyes of death, the, the band, of, um, band of assassins and ninja films, and all of these type of films that they really honed it perfectly by that stage. I'm, I'm afraid we've got two questions that we can't answer because I've had my message saying that um, we need to wind up now. They're quite interesting questions, so I hope um, perhaps, Jonathan, that you can get to Craig and Simon and, and type them an answer or something. But I think I must hand over to Junko now, who's going to... Um, say goodbye to us all yeah um, thank you very much um i actually that um i just wanted to ask that simon king's question how different takeshi kitano's interpretation of the character is it homage or something more original because i was personally very curious why Zatoj has been so influencing upon that uh, contemporary among those so jidaigeki that's um produced in Japan must be something uh, characterization that actually appealed to or format I don't know to you know as a contemporary like uh, you know Takeshi Miike, uh, Miike Takashi on then Kitano Takeshi or other people so just if you just ask answer that quickly if you can do that um, yeah, I, I can see the question specifically. Yeah, it's a really good question. How different is Takeshi Kitano's interpretation of the character? Um, it's uh, he. I don't think he wanted it to be an homage. There's lots of promotional material included on the, the DVD of the film, which was released in the UK. You can still get it in the UK as well. I've seen it go quite cheaply, um, secondhand copies on this website. So people can track this down and you can see that he's not necessarily going for homage. He emph uh, Kitano emphasizes he wanted to do a completely different uh, definitely a visual look of the character that can't be denied you know he's dressed in black and dark blue his his sword is red it's interesting he's got a red scabbard actually because that's what Oichi has in the Crimson Bat films um, so I don't know if he's aware of that or not or his, his set designer sword and he's got bleach blonde hair which had never been seen on uh, Shintaro Katsu films before so he seems determined to go that way but it does follow the standard plot almost of a Zatoichi film there is a, yet again a Yakuza conspiracy that he uncovers um and and the town literally celebrates in a song and dance festival um at the end uh as well with kitano's character it got some criticism uh kitano's interpretation of the character i've seen this a lot in uh mainly in some um western books some kind of uh and other like diehard fans of shintaro katsu's films like this is too different from what shintaro katsu did um and i don't really like it but it were i i still like the film it was kind of my entryway into the character 
And um, you can't deny the massive commercial success it had around the world. And also in Japan, it's still Kitano's most commercially successful film in Japan, which is interesting to note because the majority of his films don't make uh, his they uh, they don't make him a lot of money in Japan because he's most famous for his his TV comedy appearances. So he might have made even more money out of the Netflix film that got made about his life recently, perhaps. Uh, I imagine than his his recent um, it, it, than his recent um, you know cinematic outputs. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, so yeah, it's it, there's a bit of both in there. He desperately tries to make it original, but he still follows the same old story structure as yeah. well. I think. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, uh, um, of course, we we got to finish it. I mean, the, the, you know, you you have been very great. Um, there's so many names popping up. So many ma- names. In the back of my head, um, as a child, um, watching, talk, you know, hearing what other people are actually saying, but I'm just so curious, um, the viewership um, back then in you know, Zatoichi, are they predominantly male or females? Do you know? I mean, suddenly as a child, I, I wasn't very interested in this kind of, you know, setting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jasper's put his hand up. Because yeah, like, yeah. I, I was actually living in Tokyo when the um, Zatoichi Kitano's version came out. And of course, it won the prize at Venice before it got the release in, in Japan. So I caught a matinee screening in Ginza. Mm-hmm. And it was quite funny because there were lots of sort of middle aged women there who'd obviously yeah, grown yeah, up yeah. watching it. I- watching it on TV and they were going, oh, great, the new Kitano film. I, I wonder why. And, but they went in thinking, well, how can we have a new Zatoichi film? And also, I've never seen a Kitano film, but I heard they're not very, they're a bit arty. Yeah. And a lot of them <laughs> came out of it scratching their head at the end, going, mm, oh, all, you know, but they weren't, I don't think it was. No, I, I saw it in Tokyo as well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The afternoon I'm, audience was yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, but I'm talking about original Zatoichi where the Katsu was there rather than Kitano because Kitano was, of course, has been very famous. Mangdos is actually. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, 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 names, the, but... the original Zatoichi yeah, yes, has been it's... played on TV for that yeah. for the later yeah. generation, yeah. so it'd be quite an established character through TV repeats. Yeah, yeah, and, like and you would you do you, you, when I lived in a Japanese household, you would sit down and watch these things, um, you know women as mm. well as men. Yeah, probably. I mean, certainly I wasn't very interested in that um, Zatoichi setting itself as a child. Um, although that I was interested in other setting of Jidai Geti, like sort of, you know, um, trials or, or, you know, buddy, goodies, whatever. So not necessarily I didn't dislike Jidai Geti, but certainly Zatoichi itself I wasn't very hooked by it. I think, I think oh. when when uh, Shintaro Katsu took the character to TV, he was trying to maybe rival or follow in the footsteps of other TV series that ended up to be coming mm. uh, very long running ones in Japan, like uh, Mito Common and the yeah, yes. Shogun. Um, as I've heard, you know, they, these were series on screen for decades. So Katsu maybe had this hope that his mm-hmm. show would become one of these. And he didn't quite get there. I mean, it's still oppressive. 100 TV episodes, but nothing on the record of those other series from mm. what I've read about. Mm. Anyway, we can actually um, talk uh, on and on and on for okay. the rest of you know, the day or tomorrow, but uh, I think we should actually finish it. And then I think um, it's not, you know, I, sh- I should think about it. If you haven't got any book, you should actually buy it. And um, um, and uh, I think that Eddie already uh, put the information earlier about uh, the book disc and the book discount code. In can you actually yeah. try again? Just guess those people who actually didn't manage to copy it. And um, yeah, I would uh, say um, buy the hardback if you want to. That is sadly with the publisher of the book, it is the most expensive option. But um, the discount code also works on the ebook, which is a lot cheaper. Oh, right. Okay, okay, okay. It's a handy and the environmental yeah. friendly as well, you know, as well. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, it's there in the chat box. And Thank you, there Ellie. is a discount code over there. So if you haven't got it, it's. Um, just use the code and they get it or you can just get it from online and uh, read it because certainly it's a legend the character is a legend yeah. and then uh, uh, it's actually the first kind of book that talk about that uh, Zadoichi focusing on that this blind swordman so I highly recommend that and then thank you 
um, thank you for all, um, Jasper and then Jonathan and then Laura, um, just did that very interesting, um, kind of spontaneous and discussion uh, for this uh, the last you know hour and also without you you know you audience it wouldn't have been possible because this is slightly different in a format as we normally do because it's organically in run based on that uh, your questions and uh, I'm very very impressed uh, usually and, and as always they impressed by that the knowledge that our audiences have. I'm sure that our speakers are a little bit frightened about, you know, maybe that you know, error would be uh, corrected by that uh, audience whatsoever. But that is what the uh, um, online you know, event is about. Just uh, throw the opinion at any time and exchange that uh, uh, communication and opinion at comments. So thank you so much for your contribution. So lastly, as I said before, uh, we will send you that questionnaire. So please complete the questionnaire and um, enjoy reading the book. That's all. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. And then uh, have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank night. you for attending. Thanks for all the great questions as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.